We know that Charette, um, when we moved to the English edition, between Kobe and myself, we, we've added a number of ingredients. The additional skeletons that were suggestive of what it would be about often gave us a clue of where to look for and find protocols stenographic records of certain meetings if all he wrote was a one-liner that said spoke today to such and such a group uh, and so we, we, we were able to build more into the gaps uh, by chasing down some of the references that were not available at the time of the 1978 Hebrew version but became available more many more meetings from um, Secret or previously secret meetings, cabinet sources became available between the publication of the Hebrew and the English editions, and we were able to add much more meat to the discussion. Sometimes uh, articles from the Hebrew press that Kobe put in, we would find them or find more of them. Published memoirs that have come out uh, by some of the people who are involved added to the material that we could work with and either put into footnotes. Uh, or later, when we ran uh, a foul of um, time and uh, space limits, we started to think of creating a website where we would put up supplementary documents. And that website grew to 135 documents, which are available to anybody who buys the book and who or who doesn't have to buy the book, but just goes to the website that's listed on the, on the uh, Indiana University Press. I started working on the English translation that had already been prepared in a very amateur way by several translators when I met uh, and started to work with uh, Kobe Charvet. The English was very poor, and as Kobe read it page by page, double-checking everything, uh, there were uh, many errors. Uh, what we felt was very important was not to lose the highly nuanced, literate, and polished prose of the Hebrew, the clever allusions, the word plays uh, that were made, and sometimes that required uh, additional footnote or explanations for the English-speaking reader. Uh, a lot of email traffic between Montreal and Tel Aviv, starting off with WordPerfect 5.1 files and eventually evolving to Microsoft Word. Um, my own contribution consisted of my expertise in the history of the diplomatic documents of the period, and so I was able to adjust some of the jargon and the historical terminology of the time to the translation that was uh, rough, roughly laid out for us to work with. One decision, by the way, behind the scenes, Kobe Charette had decided in the early stages of getting a rough translation to leave out certain things, saying the English-speaking reader doesn't need to know that. Uh, he made some wise decisions, but one of them that we went back on, I don't know if you'll remember our discussion, he wanted to leave out material about the Kastner affair. And uh, at the time, it was just becoming um, more discussed and uh, we decided to return to the text all of the excisions that had been made on an earlier draft. Uh, I also felt a little sense of uh, control over producing for the English-speaking reader, a little sense of power, a little illusion of power. Uh, the, the better image of Charette when, that, when I had a choice. and um, I felt a little bit not wicked, but a little bit playful doing this, but there were a lot of places where he repeated himself. Those who were at meetings with him must have had their eyes rolling. There were lots of places where he sometimes contradicted himself un unknowingly, like, and so the use of the ellip ellipsis, uh, putting in three dots, and cutting things out, I think contributed to creating a greater sense of clarity and coherence than, than was on the ground at the time. Uh, that, this goes for uh, special stenographic records when people speak at meetings. Another editorial decision that Kobe and I did with great seriousness was to decide 
how much of the Hebrew diary to offer and where to end it. And not only were we working on it for 20 years, saying how much more, how much more, how much more, until we get to the end, uh, we also thought that taking the last volume and going beyond January 57, the, the actual quality of the diary and the number of times he sat down to write started to get very erratic and, and difficult. A lot of that time he was really obsessed with one or two speeches that Ben-Gurion made at the beginning of 1957 um, uh, that uh, really outraged him. And there were many repetitive letters of complaints, sometimes going to 50 or 70 paragraphs, asking for or begging for or, or recanting an apology, which only made him look more and more the victim of uh, Ben-Gurion. Uh, and and that, you know, that was another cut that I think deciding to end it when he returned from his Asia trip at a, highlight, at a high point and yet coming back to the country on his first day back on the trip from the airport to his home telling the Tsipora, uh, I'm back home now but my country has left me, uh, seemed like a nice dramatic moment to end the English edition and, and we, did, we did that. Another thing that had fallen between the cracks when the first eight volumes came out, Itamar quoted from the 1957 speech, which I think was also available as a pamphlet on the back table, uh, that we restored as an appendix to the diary uh, where he outlined his version of the, what became the famous two schools of thought uh, on the subject. This is, these are what we've done, and the second part of the backstory is the, the discovery of a publisher. No, nobody really wanted anything in the publishing world that's more than one volume. Uh, almost, almost all of them will tell you if you have a proposal to submit uh, if that's more than one volume. They don't, they don't want to read it. They don't have. They, they're not planning to do it. It's economically. Un Unappealing, and we found that we found that out in early 2000, 2001, when we were just starting to produce segments of the of the translation and the editing together, and so we couldn't even get at that time a statement of interest from any publisher. But we weren't discouraged; we were going to continue working on it, and we did, off and on, until 2015, and. Uh, by this time, Kobe had engaged uh, the wonderful Adi Khan as his um, graphic designer and layout specialist. And the three of us became the production team that produced sample chapters that we were able to send to Indiana University Press on the historic date of October 28th, 2015. Uh, to our great delight and surprise, we got uh, a very exciting reply, but there was a but. And this was another dramatic moment for us. The acquisition editor said, we would like to confirm our interest in the work you are doing. However, we were wondering whether an abridgment with a critical introduction and an analytical historical conclusion might be the way to, for us to move forward. We are not sure whether it would be feasible for us to move forward with the entire set of the diaries, but I believe a condensed version would be very successful for us. This put us in a huge dilemma, uh, and for a lot of reasons that anybody who was listening to the last speakers would understand, this, this diary I don't think could stand chopping up or condensing. The integral flavor of it and the day-by-day -day needlepoint work that goes into it is really something that cannot survive and be effective if it's cut and uh, cannibalized in that way. So we had to decide, do we insist on holding off, saying no thanks, uh, we needed the full diary? Or do we say yes so that we have something certain in hand and we will publish an abridged one and then maybe later work on the full one? Uh, we decided immediately that, that we were going to gamble. And we drafted our reply to Indiana University Press, putting all our cards on the table. We started off 
this way. I didn't spend a lot of time on this memo, so I'm proud of it, and I'll give you some sentences from it. Uh, only because it worked. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh, so we told them that their suggestion uh, might prove to be a stumbling block, and, and we decided to play up Charette's historic significance for the benefit of the editors and other decision makers who made. So we pointed out that we were dealing here with an important and unique historical document written by one of Israel's three founding fathers, the other two being Chaim Weizmann and David Ben-Gurion. And we all know the treasure of public, uh, published, published memoirs, letters uh, that these two gentlemen have enjoyed. And while not uh, putting ourselves on the same level, we wanted to say our publishing of the Shesharet Diary in English is meant to register for posterity a similar historic document that at the same time provides a detailed and intimate portrait of the life and times of Israel during the formative period of the young Israeli state. And then without getting nasty, we try to push, it, push back against their notion of the format of books. We thought that this particular one was an exception that merits special attention and consideration outside of the normal parameters and limitations of monographs and biographies, which we seem to be you know, very stuck with. And then we closed and begged and hoped things would work out. We concluded with the statement that if it's shortened too much, it becomes a different sort of publication, voiding our main purpose in making it available to the English pub, reading public. And with great joy, uh, by February, they, they said, we're ready to issue a contract on the basis that you have suggested. Two big buts. One of them, of course, is that we pay for and provide the camera-ready copy save them money, and the other one, save them money also, that we provide, and I think this is now standard practice for many academic publications, uh, a subsidy for uh, each of the volumes. So that was a very dramatic moment. Now we finally got the result. Um, there were some delays in the production line which are too petty to, uh, to go in into. Along the way, we had to make another interesting decision. This one was much more fun to consider. What to put on as a title. Uh, in Montreal, Marilyn and I had uh, consultations with friends and family. What do you think uh, of different ideas? Kobe did the same with his friends and, and the uh, close circle. And the editor at IU Press also had her ideas of what is the, uh, the appropriate title, and we had a fear that they would force their title on us. Um, in the end, um, you could see some of the phrasing that has to deal with the kind of Moshe Charette that we wanted to, to bring to the English-speaking public. Um, the notion of peace was very elastic, and for a while some people said, don't put it in the title, it's, uh, it's just too, too open-ended. Other people said the hawks and doves don't do it, it's too much in the, as a cliché. There were a lot of reasons why there were pros and cons for each one. What we wanted to capture, no matter what title it was, was the sober statesmanship that Charette represented versus, versus the um, jingoism or activism or patriotism that uh, the other school or the supporters of the other school um, as a personal confession also, maybe Kobe and Adi will remember, when we voted, my favorite was committed to peace. Maybe that shows my cautious Canadianism right there. Also, it showed, it wanted me, I wanted to stress his dedication and his commitment as a profound quality, and yet struggle is much more active. And I, I accepted the being outvoted because I, I do see the reason, and, and I think Kobe and everybody around Moshe Sharon at that time must have felt the stress of his struggle. And I think that's not uh, such a bad title then. Um, I'm almost near the end. Yes. What about the legacy? Uh, some people have said 
but a legacy is not really what a person may, means to leave behind. And we, we heard about how ambiguous the instructions were about what should happen to the diary and that we have to make something of it and Kobe did make something of it. A legacy is not really what a person meant to leave behind, but rather what other people do with it. And I think that's very profound for now. Some, for instance, would look at the life and career of uh, their hero is Abba Evan. They would say, there walks the legacy of uh, Moshe Sharet. Others would look at others, Yossi Balin, perhaps. Be that uh, as it may, people who do remember him and knew him well will admire him for the warmth, his empathy, his dedication to family and friends, his personal integrity, his moral compass, his loyalty to party and friends, and his unselfish service to the Zionist movement and to the state. Now, is that how history remembers him? Not according to Haaretz. Of all places, Haaretz ranked him seven out of 12 in their committee point system generated list of Israel's 12 prime ministers. If anybody wants to know where their favorite came before or after Sharet, I, I can tell you. The expectations that we have of the English edition, among other things, are maybe in a future edition of the ranking game of Israeli prime ministers, maybe they'll bump him up to six or five. But uh, at a more serious level, we want to restore Israel's forgotten prime minister uh, to memory. And through the English publication, we're hoping that this will happen. Uh, a phrase that Yaakov Sharet did when he also alluded this morning to the narrow base of Hebrew-speaking readers versus the global base of English-speaking readers, we wanted to, in Kobe's words, liberate Moshe Sharet from his Hebrew prison. And the fourth expectation that I think is important for the legacy of Moshe Sharet that we are offering the English editions is it does reopen the discussion we've heard so well expressed from different perspectives this morning about could things have been different had Moshe Sharet taken a different road. And this is the question that Kobe and I slightly differ on. Did he represent an alternative way forward in the mid-50s, a road that was not taken? Or was he, in any case, an idealist, a fine gentleman, but essentially too weak a politician to carry out any change? Were his role and influence limited to offering alternatives on paper and in private discussions, but with no chance of activating a popular base to back him on government policy that would lead Israeli uh, decision-making in another direction. Kobe Sharet has already written an article, and mentioned it before, that things might have been different if he had stayed in the cabinet and become a focal point or a magnet for some of the restraining or opposition forces to moving forward with a plan for this 56 war. Uh, on the book jacket, we also, or I took a an executive decision to allow co a copy text that is very playful with that suggestion and suggests that there might have been another way, uh, even at the risk of angering some Bangorian supporters, maybe critics will point to this jacket blurb in another review or two and mention that this couldn't have been and it couldn't have been, but I didn't mind the opening that discussion because I think that's an important discussion. So we deliberately slanted the presentation uh, on the cover of the book to suggest that it will, uh, it, could, it might have been different. Whether it is or it isn't, readers can now choose whichever seems the most convincing. Now that they have a wonderful diary with its daily detail and its eloquence to help them decide. So thank you very much.